Good morning all. Now we are going to start a presentation. The presenter uh, is Dr. P. Rajendra Kumar, principal scientist, IAFMR Hyderabad. Actually to introduce him, uh, he is a very eminent scientist, well-known scientist at uh, Miller Research. <laughs> Good morning to all. I welcome you all for this uh, presentation, I mean a lecture. Uh, I am proud to introduce uh, the scientist Dr. P. Rajendra Kumar. He is a principal scientist in IAMR Hyderabad. Uh, he, he is actually the alumni of TNAU. Uh, now uh, he is currently engaged in Surgam Nutrition and bio, Biofuel Quality Improvement. And he has some other uh, project also in his hand. And he actually he is involved in Codomillet whole genome sequencing. He is also involved in Little Millet SSR market development. He has a very good uh, uh, experience in Millet research. Uh, he has published around five books and edited one book. And he bagged eight awards in, uh, in uh, Millet research paper, in Millet research. So I proudly invite Dr. P. Rajendra Kumar for uh, giving a lecture on genomic strategies for millet improvement. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sashi Kumar, for the introduction. So I am really happy to be back after five years uh, to uh, CPBG. So in 2019, I came for a training to, to give a lecture. So, I will be sharing today with you like uh, the research what we are doing there at uh, uh, Indian Institute of Millet's Research. So, I will be uh, focusing on genomic strategies for millet improvement overall, but majority of my uh, talk will be concentrating on sorghum where we have done some substantial uh, research and development. Whereas in other millets, like these crops were added only some five, six years back to our institute. Previously, our institute was a directorate of sorghum research and uh, it was upgraded to Indian Institute of Millets Research. And uh, uh, recently in March 2023, so our uh, Honorable Prime Minister uh, Sri Narendra Modi ji has uh, dedicated our institute as a global center of excellence on millets. So we have a big responsibility now to cater to the needs of the world. So we are proud to say that our institute is the only institute in the world uh, exclusively working on millets. No other institute in the world works exclusively on all the millets, starting from sorghum pearl millet and uh, other uh, small millets. So we have around uh, 45 scientists and other technical and uh, other uh, categories. And uh, we do have a regional center at Solapur as well as Varangal. So I will be sharing some of the aspects in the current uh, climate change scenario also, because uh, rightly it has been decided by uh, India under the leadership of our prime minister to give more importance to millets, because we are slowly forgetting uh, the value of millets. Uh, after a lot of uh, pumping of uh, money in rice and wheat research, so we are uh, uh, we are producing too much of uh, food grains nowadays, and uh, we totally forgot about the nutritional aspects of the grains. So that is the reason why we are uh, now facing with a lot of lifestyle diseases. Diabetes is very prevalent, and uh, even uh, heart diseases also. Previously, heart diseases was considered as uh, uh, because of uh, like uh, cholesterol and uh, all those things. Nowadays, what they tell, because of large intake of carbohydrates. So that is the reason behind uh, the all sorts of uh, lifestyle diseases. So coming to the current focus as a breeder. So we should uh, look for water use efficiency because now Every input is becoming very scarce or uh, labor is becoming very costly. So we should be very efficient. We, may, we should make the plant very efficient uh, in its ability to produce uh, the grains. So we should look, uh, look for nutrition, nutrient use efficiency so that with limited input we get a very good uh, production. 
and uh, with climate change uh, there is very strange things happening like the diseases which are not very uh, devastating as becoming devastating i can give examples like uh, uh, if you take pearl millet previously down me downy mildew was considered as a very devastating disease now blast is becoming a, a major disease as compared to downy mildew in sorghum if you take uh, the fall army worm uh, started attacking uh, previously it was considered as a pest in maize now it is attacking sorghum and uh, the pokabayang disease which was not known for so many years in sorghum now we are uh, getting uh, the symptoms of pokabayang so these changes are because of the climate change conditions so even uh, at hyderabad i am there for last 23 years so previously some five years back the rainfall used to uh, come from june to september so now the condition has become very strange that the uh, rain starts in march and it goes till november so we cannot uh, predict like what will happen because uh, as a, that is the main reason why this karif sorghum is uh, decreasing very drastically the area in karif sorghum you see it has become very very less because of the grain mold problem because with persistence rain at uh, continuous uh, intervals it affects the grain so the blackening of grain happens and uh, a lot of problem is happening so now we are uh, looking uh, the for the strategies how to promote sorghum in uh, uh, kharif because of this grain mold problem so we will be looking into different aspects like uh, uh, as uh, in my introduction sashi kumar was selling biofuel so biofuel one, is one of the aspect which we will be targeting to push sorghum uh, in competition with the commercial crops because unless a farmer gets some good profit he will not go for crops like millets so another thing is uh, in rabi still uh, the uh, sorghum area is uh, being maintained because of the grain quality grain quality of rabi sorghum is very superior even though there are some issues uh, with respect to the micronutrient because micronutrient is not that great in uh, sorghum so these type of aspects i will be discussing and uh, we with the climate change situation we have to look for early maturity uh, the, the environment stress tolerance and uh, we have to get a good yield protection out of all these aspects so coming to climate change what is climate change so it is uh, it is not a very immediate thing happening it is for a uh, significantly long term the uh, patterns are changing and uh, because of the changes in temperature and precipitation over the years uh, now we are uh, uh, seeing the effect of this climate change and the major co contribution is by concentration of carbon dioxide because we are using lot of uh, exploiting fossil fuels and other things uh, which uh, causes greenhouse emission and uh, even lot of uh, commercial crops uh, like uh, many of this crops they uh, add to the greenhouse emission so now the uh, focus is mainly on c4 crops which are more uh, having a very good uh, very low ca carbon print footprint they leave to the atmospheric condition so these millets are all, all these millets are the c4 crops which are very efficient in their uh, photosynthesis and uh, it, it is uh, high, it has a very good potential for production unless uh, uh, if you give a i can i can give one example of sorghum uh, generally people have a uh, thought that uh, millets they don't yield much uh, it is very poor yielding like that so if you take sorghum if we go give, give proper inputs it can give yield up to 10 tons per hectare it has been demonstrated in guntur region krishna basin area so where uh, the sorghum uh, uh, in rice fellows so our institute has been promoting sorghum in rice fellows generally at a, a station level you, you get 3 to 4 tons yield but if you go to the guntur region where uh, for rice they are dumping so much of fertilizer urea and all so you get on an average of 6 to 7 tons some farmers are getting 10 tons so that is the potential uh, which is present in these millets so this uh, are the different uh, the climatic uh, events which uh, you can see in the last two decade there is very drastic uh, effect of this uh, either it may be temperature rainfall or uh, uh, wind and all those things so because of this uh, uh, long term uh, uh, changes in the events we are getting the impact in the crop uh, production 
So, what are the effects of climate change in agricultural production? We can classify these effects into direct, indirect, and socio-economic effects. As listed here, direct effects it uh, directly uh, affects the morphological causes morphological changes, physiological, phenotypic, and it affects the plant productivity. And with respect to indirect, uh, it affects soil fertility. There is a problem in uh, irrigation, uh, rise in sea level, uh, and all these salinity sort of things are also happening. Heat, flood, drought, because uh, nowadays uh, uh, they, if it rains, it pours, they tell. So if you see in Hyderabad, it rains for one hour, you, will, you cannot go out in the streets. That is the situation. So such is the effect of the climate change. And uh, socioeconomic, uh, there is demand of food, farmer's response, because the most uh, affected person is the farmer. He is totally confused like what crop to put, uh, whether he will get the yield, whether the car crop will be affected by drought or uh, flood. So that is the situation. And uh, the increasing costs of input, the policy of the government, all this plays uh, a major role. And uh, we need all this uh, inter uh, human intervention, adaptation changes and mitigation changes. So this, uh, if the changes are effective, then only you can sustain the production. So this is the scenario what we are facing at present. And uh, this needs a very integrated uh, breeding approach. So instead of focusing uh, very specific problems, we have to integrate different uh, strategies. So as uh, to tackle climate change, both biotic and abiotic stress. So you need a very good phenotypic screening, like in today's presentation also, we saw the screening and all those things. A lot of things are involved, artificial screening, natural screening and all. And uh, germplasm collection, land races, they play a more important role because we have not exploited much of the variability for uh, major uh, trades like this. So we have to exploit that uh, trades. And we have to go uh, integrate genomics, phenomics, and uh, molecular breeding so that we can uh, get a very good output. So you go for high throughput genotyping because nowadays uh, sequencing costs are reduced. So if you see in many of the publications, nowadays they don't use SSR markers also. They go directly go for SNPs. So that is the uh, advancement we, what has happened because of the cost reduction in these technologies. And you map QTL and isolate uh, or identify genes responsive for these QTLs, you can go for either association mapping or biparental mapping. And uh, once you identify the target genes uh, or candidate genes, it can be uh, used through molecular breeding to develop uh, varieties uh, by intragression. Or you can go for transgenics and uh, use that uh, gene in some other crops also. So important aspect is physiology comes into the uh, uh, forefront because of the climate uh, changes. So we have to screen for uh, biotic and abiotic stress. We need high, high throughput screening facility. Like you see in IRI, they have developed an automated screening facility that is image-based systems. They have different compartments, uh, the modules for, uh, for example, uh, uh, for measuring the yield components, for measuring the relative water content, for measuring the chlorophyll content. So different types of uh, uh, modules are available to entirely uh, measure the physiology in, uh, involved in this, uh, any plant. So that uh, nowadays it is becoming very much uh, important because whatever uh, our uh, mapping uh, result depends on phenotyping. So genotyping is perfect, we know, because it is straightforward. You just uh, uh, take DNA, you genotype the plant and, uh, uh, sample, and you get the data. But phenotyping decides the, uh, the reliability of your uh, uh, marker. Once phenotype is not correct, uh, then whatever marker you identify, it may not be a reliable one. So many of us, we don't uh, concentrate much on phenotyping. That is a major mistake what we are doing. And many of these marker-rested breeding programs uh, they are not successful because of this. Because basic research into the uh, dissecting the phenotype into the effective components is not happening. So simply we are just taking some traits. Drought means we are taking uh, some traits, leaf angle, some uh, root uh, length, something like that. Some four or five traits, uh, relative water content, transpiration, like that. But uh, drought being a complex trait, it does not uh, involve only the morphological or physiological traits. It involves biochemical. There are so many biochemicals involved. So at a stress situation, so many biochemicals are also produced. So there should be a wholesome uh, uh, approach for uh, phenotyping. It should not be focused only like a limited uh, thing. So when you concentrate at limited aspect, so you are, you are not uh, 
considering the total variability present for that particular complex trait. So that's why all your uh, uh, succeeding experiments will be a problem. So even though if you identify a marker, it may not be a uh, reliable one. If you transfer into different genetic background, it may not work. So a lot of problems are happening. So that's why we should be very uh, much uh, focused into the physiological aspect. So uh, with the announcement of Global Center of Excellence, our institute also will be developing this automated uh, uh, phenotyping systems, uh, maybe in one or two years, so that it will be used for uh, uh, what you say, precise phenotyping of the uh, uh, mapping population or any association mapping panel like that. So when you all integrate this and you develop a cultivar, and uh, uh, it, it, you can have develop a multiple uh, stress resistant cultivar. So very uh, effective uh, market rate associations can be identified. So that when you transfer uh, or intragress into different uh, elite uh, lines, then it will be sustainable over long period of time. So that is the uh, aspect we are dealing with. So for this, uh, as today also we have seen gen genetic resources play a major role because the breeding depends on what what genetic resource you are taking. So whether uh, the target trait we are, uh, which we are uh, uh, using, whether it has uh, sufficient variability present in your population. So that decides your success of the identification of any of the uh, QTL or market rate associations. So these are reservoirs of valuable genes. We are not exploited uh, in many of the crops for over years because we are talking so many things about land, rage, land races, uh, even farmers varieties, there are a lot of farmers varieties which are having very good quality. So nobody looks into all these aspects. So as a breeder, like uh, that is because of the situation we were, we were in uh, when the uh, Green Revolution happened, our focus only was for uh, yield improvement because that time we were not uh, sufficient in food production. We have to deal with the increasing population. So our uh, the breeders focus was totally into the yield improvement. So other things have been sidelined sideline over years. So now we have become a self-sufficient country in food production. So we should concentrate more into the nutrition and all this uh, climate change aspects because in future uh, agriculture production will not be as easy as it was before. So there will be a lot of uh, issues with uh, your uh, uh, climate change. So we have to exploit these genetic resources. The concept of core uh, collection has been given in 1984 by Frankel and Brown. It is the 10% of the 10% uh, of the total uh, genetic resources present. It, it represents the entire variability in the total genetic resources. So that 10% is called uh, core collection. Mini core is 10% uh, of the core. That is 1% of the total collection. So uh, for any association mapping uh, uh, research, these are uh, very good uh, uh, material to start with. So as I told, uh, you should be uh, having an optimum population size. So generally, uh, if you see uh, over the years, anything around 200 to 300 genotypes. So it will be an optimum population size. Even for QTL mapping also, we suggest uh, uh, more than 200 uh, genotypes. So we use in many, some of the crops uh, in small millets, uh, the mini core collection is very small. It is 65 or something because the total collection itself is very less. So in that case, you, ha you have to either go for core, core collection or uh, mini core depending on the size of the population. Because if you take sorghum, core collection will be more, mini core may be uh, uh, lesser. But in small millets, mini core itself, core itself will be less, and mini core is even less. So, based on the opt optimum population size, you select the either mini core or core for your uh, mapping purposes. So, this uh, the, this uh, constitute a diversity panel. So it will be used for assessing the population structure diversity, for allele mining, and so many things. So, coming to the core collection in millets, so you see crop wise, uh, these are the core and mini core collection. You can see sorghum, uh, uh, the uh, core collection you have see 225. That is a very optimum size. You, even you have mini core size of uh, 242. This 242 mini core is being used in many of the association mapping works in sorghum. And if you come to this fast sale millet and other, you can see the core collection itself is very less than uh, 200. So in that case, you have to 
reconstitute the core uh, uh, in the sense that you get a optimum level of uh, the population and you can use for the uh, association mapping purpose and uh, in indigenous millets like kodo and uh, little we have very less because the total collection itself is in uh, few thousands so your um, core itself is uh, less than 100 so in that case there are a lot of work has to be done so that you bring the uh, core into the optimum size and you go for uh, further mapping purposes so coming to the whole genome sequence in millets these are the crops where you have the whole genome currently sorghum is the first crop to be sequenced in 2009 and uh, pearl millet and finger millet was completed in 2017 and fast cell millet was completed in 2012 this is the uh, uh, small millet, first small millet to, to be sequenced. But uh, next to finger millet, finger millet genome was sequenced in India by, by US Bangalore uh, group. And uh, prosa millet uh, is sequenced in a um, uh, few years back, three, four years back. So we are currently uh, completed 75% of codo millet genome sequencing. Shortly, we will be completing the complete genome of uh, this thing also. And little millet uh, sequencing has been completed by ILS Bhuvaneshwar. It has not been published till now, but they have completed the little millet genome sequencing. And uh, with respect to barnyard millet, uh, in, uh, Japanese barnyard millet has been sequenced, whereas Indian barnyard millet has not been sequenced. So this is the status of genome sequencing in millets, which uh, plays a major role in the marker development. So these are the genomic resources uh, with respect to the markers. In sorghum, there are so many thousands of markers, different categories of markers reported over the years by many groups. And uh, in pearl millet also, you have uh, uh, many SNP, SSRC, like that. Whereas you come to small millets, uh, not much has been done. Like uh, in finger and fast tail millet, you have some markers. Uh, in uh, fast tail, you have a large number of markers, uh, finger millet also. Whereas in other small millets, the, 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 uh, especially in little millet, only EST, some few hundreds of EST markers have been reported. Whereas in Kodo and uh, little uh, uh, Kodo millet, no marker has been reported, uh, even in barnyard millet. So you can see proso millet. Uh, in Kodo, little and barnyard, only some SNPs have been reported through some population, uh, some GVS based study CRISAT uh, group has done. So few thousands of SNPs, there are no SSR has been reported. So coming to the genotyping aspect, uh, as I told now genotyping, a uh, lot of advancements have been happening. So see, there are sequence based platforms and uh, cheaper array based platforms. So previously sequence based platforms uh, um, were uh, predominant, but nowadays uh, these axiom arrays and uh, other array systems are becoming predominant because uh, of high throughput uh, uh, nature and uh, uh, good uh, multiplexing capability. So I don't want to go into detail. These are some of the sequence based system, genotyping based sequencing. Uh, so RDNA sequence, restriction DNA, uh, site associated DNA sequencing. So like that many are there. And CHIP you have Golden Gate, Infinium, uh, Infinium Select, Axiom like that. So each has uh, different uh, throughputs. You see uh, Illumina based uh, bead array technology. See here it, is uses, it uses beads coated with specific oligos that can be placed in pattern. There are micro wells in that. And uh, it uh, allows for high multiplexing of SNPs. And uh, here the throughput is you can uh, detect uh, 48 to 384 as well as 384 to 3072 SNPs per sample. This much is the, uh, the throughput of this technology. When you come to Infinium assays, uh, here it is an improved method where you can go up to 300 to more than 5 million allele calls per sample. So the throughput has been uh, drastically improved. Uh, it is a two color based uh, system, uh, single base extension uh, technology. Uh, from single probe, it, uh, single base extension happens you, and you get a uh, genotyping data. This is a very popular asymmetric axiom uh, technology. So this is a chip based technology based on uh, here also two, two color. This is ligation based assay. And here uh, you, you can uh, uh, genotype 384 samples with uh, 50,000 SNPs you can genotype. At a time 384 samples with 50,000 SNPs. 
so like that uh, these things have been improved uh, over the years so coming to the phenotyping as i already told we have good uh, genetic resources we have good genotyping technology uh, we have good genomic genomic resources also but if your phenotyping if your phenotyping is not perfect then you cannot identify effective qtls so that is very simple so if three things are good and one is not good so it is a waste of time so we should be focusing more on the phenotyping aspect and uh, here uh, comes the high throughput phenotyping you can see the uh, improvement in gen genetic gain uh, because of the high throughput phenotyping at different levels so it has direct and uh, indirect uh, effects so you can see as i told uh, like uh, image based uh, phenotyping and uh, you have uh, genetic variation identification of novel variants in a control condition if you phenotype you can uh, identify a lot of variations and uh, you have a decision uh, support system also integrated into that so that whatever data uh, the phenotyping data you have high throughput phenotyping tools for breeder preferred traits like yield and yield related traits and uh, different models uh, can be prediction models can be integrated into the phenotyping uh, uh, this system and uh, finally it gives a decision like which parameter to be considered uh, for the final uh, uh, phenotyping of a particular trait and that uh, phenotypic data can be used for uh, uh, you in combination with the genotypic data to identify the marker trait associations so coming to the different platforms available ground as well as aerial platforms are there you can see like micro satellites some um, aerial vehicles some uh, drone based systems uh, fitted with some cameras of uh, high resolution uh, imaging uh, systems and mo uh, movable uh, systems are there like like a, a, a trolley type it will be there you can see that uh, you can just move and uh, you can uh, decide okay. so such kind of uh, systems are uh, available so these uh, technologies uh, depending upon our uh, uh, feasibility uh, or economics so you can go for uh, like uh, bigger systems or uh, very uh, portable systems so that you can do uh, effective phenotyping yeah, every uh, each of these uh, systems depending on the image analysis only so it detects the uh, crop uh, from the aerial view and uh, uh at different uh, levels and it can uh, identify the uh, each and every component so even uh, plant height or leaf uh, area leaf width like that uh, all type of uh, uh, phenotypic data can be uh, taken so this is very important uh, for uh, doing a precise phenotyping uh, in the uh, uh, to get a uh, reliable data so coming to this uh, system you can see at different growth uh, stages of the plant you have the movable system where the camera will move and you can uh, uh, measure characters like standard count spike count yield components uh, you can go for dc screening uh, based on the image analysis it will detect whether it is susceptible it will be resistant because some control will be there you will be giving uh, this is susceptible resistance so it will match uh, your uh, sample with that and it will say whether it is resistant or susceptible and it can uh, give 3d construction also like um, three dimensional uh, uh, if a plant is there uh, it it gets a three dimensional uh, measurement uh, different leaf angles different types of uh, characters it uh, you can uh, measure so some of the plant phenotyping system has been implemented in uh, especially sorghum so if you see uh, especially for plant stresses like drought and chilling stress so this fluorescence uh, chlorophyll fluorescence imaging is uh, one of the important trait which can be uh, measured using this uh, phenotypic systems and 3d imaging through laser scanning techniques and uh, uh, depth time of uh, flight sensors can be effective because uh, of the uh movement of the camera in different uh, directions you get that 3d imaging uh, data also and these are some of the examples uh, have been given phenobot 1.0 so it is an auto steered and self propelled uh, field based uh, high throughput phenotypic platform it is it has been reported for sorghum 
and uh, with respect to root phenotyping a low cost technology has been developed uh, for high throughput root phenotyping this is also uh, reported in sorghum it is equipped with image uh, box for in situ imaging so such type of six systems are coming up nowadays for uh, uh, many of this uh, phenotyping in uh, important uh, crops so coming to the breeding for environmental stress uh, in this uh, climate change situations so most of the traits uh, um, the main traits which we target is phenology as well as flowering because this this is decided by the environment so most of this trait uh, traits offering the high temperatures uh, uh, are association associated with flowering this uh, pollen viability as well as variation in growth so we, we have to consider these traits in combination uh, combination so that we get a very good uh, plant uh, phenotype uh, which is uh, adaptable to the climate change conditions so coming to abiotic stress you have major uh, drought as well as salinity so these are uh, major challenges in different parts of our country uh, we are facing uh, nowadays and uh, with respect to drought tolerance uh, the traits like stay, stay green low transpiration uh, rate uh, rate then uh, this some of the genes has been identified like cbl interacting protein kinase and a gene associated with tata box so these uh, traits can be targeted and uh, uh, used for developing uh, improved cultivars with respect to salinity like uh, there are six qtls have been reported in sorghums and one in pearl millet uh, uh, basically nag gene b zip basic helix loop family so these are some of the uh, genes which are related to some Uh, heat shock protein kind of thing where uh, uh, it they play an uh, play an important role under the stress situations to maintain the uh, stability of the plant during these uh, situations so some of the genes have been reported in finger millet and foxtail millet also uh, through uh, association mapping approaches and uh, coming to the some of the major effect genes in reported in many of the millets so here is a list of the traits Uh, which you can go like maturity stay green uh, late emergence uh, you can go for uh, cold tolerance so grain yield uh, under uh, cold uh, drought stress so such type of uh, qtls have been identified uh, which has uh, been giving substantial uh, phenotypic variance also so you can see more than uh, all or more than 10 so which can be effectively utilized for this and with respect to pearl millet uh, most of the qtls have been uh, associated with uh, drought as well as grain yield so here also some effective qtls have been identified and uh, fast style millet you have uh, qtls for uh, salinity drought uh, herbicide tolerance aluminum tolerance and uh, in the case of pro proso millet uh, they have identified for heading date and some of the yield components so coming to the biotic stress as i told because of this climate change uh, the diseases which are not predominant over the years they are coming up and creating problems because we were concerned with some of the diseases and we were uh, working towards that for so many years and suddenly a disease like blast uh, getting uh, predominance in pearl millet and some other diseases or pests they suddenly attack they cause lot of uh, damage so these uh, things uh, incidents happen for example uh, in the sorghum uh well, recently for the past 4 5 years this aphids is becoming a very big problem in uh, especially rabi sorghum so these are because of the climate change and high temperature during flowering and maturity so we have to work towards such kind of uh, things which were not uh, major issues uh, previously and uh, like i already told pokka buying disease has been noticed recently for the last 3 uh, to 4 years and uh, it is also um, uh, seen in many of the fields so for this uh, we have genotyping phenotyping now we have uh, our uh, aim is to map qtl sorry to identify marker trait associations for uh, such traits so in mapping uh, earlier we we were using uh, the biparental based uh, linkage mapping so many of the crops have been mapped and uh, uh in uh, some of the uh, cases we don't uh, get uh, the expected uh, output when you go for uh, marker rested uh, breeding or these things so the main reason behind that is uh, we are selecting two parents uh, from the known uh, variability 
and uh, we are uh, developing population it is a very narrow approach so whatever variability the parents represent that uh, part only you are uh, taking and you are identifying the qtl whereas uh, in human uh, genetics or, uh, or in animal genetics association mapping has been used as a major tool for improvement for example if you say even in a uh, poultry or any animal uh, breeding so this has been uh, used as a major tool for uh, drastic improvement in the uh, production so nowadays uh, for the last 5 uh, to 10 years in plant sciences also this is becoming as a major uh, thing because here what we can do is we can uh, target the complete variability present in the germplasm so the germplasm can be targeted the entire variation can be taken and we can uh, resolve the qtls or we identify the marker trait associations which are very effective as compared to the Uh, linkage uh, biparental based uh, linkage mapping so in uh, this association mapping is based on the uh, linkage disequilibrium whereas linkage mapping is uh, biparental mapping is based on the linkage uh, linkage so in linkage disequilibrium there is a, a, a non random association of alleles so we for target that and we identified uh, the marker trait uh, associations in the population which we are uh, considering for the mapping purposes so these are some of the examples uh, advantages or disadvantages with uh, um, linkage mapping as compared to genome wide association and uh, candidate gene based association like uh, major uh, thing you see uh, the in the case of association mapping your resolution uh, has been increased and you have uh, uh, population uh, uh, size uh, plays a major role and uh, you you can identify very uh, efficient and stable qtls uh, as compared to your uh, linkage analysis uh, and the another is, uh, thing is uh, for mapping population itself in uh, biparental mapping you have to spend lot of time to develop a population whereas uh, in link, uh, association mapping you have a ready made like you take the germplasm resource and you use as a mapping population and uh, genome wide association mapping uh, you use when uh, you don't have any information about the trait you are uh, interested in for example you, uh, you have drought you don't know like uh, what are the genes involved you don't know any aspect uh, what metabolic uh, metabolic pathway it is involved so in such cases you go for genome wide association mapping where you take uh, the markers consider markers all over the genome it is distributed all over the genome to identify the marker trait association whereas in the case of candidate gene mapping i can say an example which we have done uh, you take a micronutrient iron and zinc content so already the pathways we know the iron metabolism zinc metabolism we know what are the genes involved uh, mean many of the crops they have been identified and reported so in such case there is no need for going for the genome wide uh, markers you just go target only those uh, candidate genes then uh, you sequence those genes and identify the snps from that and you go for association mapping so that is another uh, way of that so uh, when you come to advantages of uh, association mapping you can see uh, so many things are there uh, when compared to linkage analysis and other uh, things and um, in most of the criteria like uh, starting from allelic rich, uh, richness number of markers required efficiency of uh, uh, the thing and uh, resolution of the uh, map and uh, uh, the statistical power of uh, the precision with which uh, the identify the marker trait associations so in all these aspects association mapping is having the advantage over the biparental mapping so some of the example uh, you see they have done uh, genome wide association mapping in sorghum anthraconos disease so this is uh, the major disease especially in the case of uh, fodder sorghum so uh, they have done genome wide uh, they have identified genome wide snps more than 2 lakhs genome wide snps and they have uh, uh, identified the uh, marker trait associations in different chromosomes you can see chromosome 5 chromosome 1 so this is the way they have used this uh, SAP that is Sorghum Association Mapping Panel. I have listed some many as core collections and association mapping panels. So one of the 
association mapping panels they have used in this, uh, which uh, they constituted in uh, United States. And uh, this has been, uh, market rate associ associations have been identified for sorghum anthraconose. And uh, the work what we are doing uh, at IIMR is uh, like uh, we are uh, focusing on sorghum biofortification, especially micronutrient like iron and zinc. So you can see the variability of uh, this iron and zinc in the released uh, uh, varieties and cultivars. So it is not very high. You can see it is very less. So our aim is to increase the iron and zinc content in the cultivars through marker-rested breeding. So for that, for, as a first step, we want to identify the uh, marker rate associations with respect to iron and zinc, grain iron and zinc content in the sorghum. So as I told, uh, we know the entire metabolic pathway of iron and zinc uh, and what are the genes involved. So what, uh, what was our idea is, so these are the important genes involved in the iron and zinc metabolism, which were reported in many of the major cereal crops. So we have pulled out uh, the genes uh, sequences from these crops and uh, we have done for comparative genomics approach like uh, first we have selected the candidate genes in the from the literature and we retrieved the gene sequence from the uh, sorghum genome which is available in the phytosome so then we went for the uh, the transcriptome uh, data and candidate genes uh, we have pulled out from morokoshi database that is very specific to sorghum so uh, then from uh, sorghum genome snp database sorgsd so there uh, they have SNP data for uh, 48 diverse genotypes, genome-wide SNPs they have identified. So from that we have uh, pulled out the SNPs which are present in these uh, candidate genes. We have pulled out the SNPs and we have uh, uh, a target, uh, we have developed primers uh, for uh, CASP uh, genotyping. CASP means competitive allele specific PCR. So that is a technology where uh, you can uh, target the particular SNP, you design the primers and uh, uh, you can uh, genotype uh, using the fluorescent uh, uh, probes. So this uh, technology we used and we did the uh, SNP genotyping and we identified uh, after the analysis. So in all the candidate genes, you can see different number of SNPs have been identified. So these are some 22 genes are there. So uh, in these 22 genes, we have identified 143 SNPs. So you can see it is uh, spread across all the 10 chromosomes. So some chromosomes are having more number of um, SNPs, some are having few number of SNPs. So it has spread all over the chromosome in these candidate genes. So we did uh, the CASP genotyping. So it gives uh, different, uh, di it discriminates the uh, different alleles, one allele from the other allele based on this color. So we t take this uh, genotypic data and uh, we did uh, phenotyping across uh, different location. We did in uh, Hyderabad, Warangal like that for iron and zinc content. So different, uh, uh, SNPs uh, have, were genotyped and uh, uh, before uh, going for association analysis we did for a uh, population structure also because the main aspect in uh, association mapping is your population which you have constituted it should not be a highly structured population the, it should be a minimal it should have minimal subpopulation so that is the suitable population for uh, association mapping so when we did the uh, population structure analysis using some 60 SSR markers spread across the genome. So we identified only two subgroups. The K value was two, so it is showing that two, two subpopulation. So it is an optimum population for the association mapping. So using this genotypic and uh, the phenotypic data, we uh, did uh, association mapping and we identified around eight uh, market rate associations for iron and zinc content. And uh, you can see from the table, some of the uh, iron and zinc genes, they are co-located. So that is very close to each other. So that there is a possibility of simultaneous improvement of iron as well as zinc. That is the one of the advantage uh, which we find because uh, you, can, you see the first one, uh, chromosome uh, four, the first two, one, one uh, market rate association is for zinc, one is for iron content. So same, uh, you can see the co-location of this uh, uh, market rates. So we wanted to exploit this uh, uh, in the further uh, breeding program, which we'll be doing. 
for introducing these qtls uh, into the elite uh, rabi sorghum because uh, for food purposes generally rabi sorghum is being used karif sorghum is mostly for industrial use so where i will be focusing on biofuel so this is with respect to rabi sorghum so to improve the micronutrient content in the cultivars so why we are going for uh, the margarested breeding is like uh, precision and to save time and resources so i will give one example like uh, uh, the how we developed a low lignin sorghum uh, for uh, so biofuel production in uh, uh, sorghum so uh, how uh, we targeted three recessive genes we introduced so to develop a low lignin sorghum as a conventional breeding you you cannot imagine like how many years it will take to introgress so this we did in 5 years we could uh, introgress the genes and we developed a low lignin sorghum and uh, that i will be discussing in coming uh, slides so with respect to pearl millet earlier uh, they have reported this hhb 67 uh, this is also using mass one of the parent uh, parental line was uh, developed uh, using marker rested uh, selection and another parent through conventional breeding so there is a combination of conventional breeding and marker rested selection and then they developed a improved hybrid so this is one of the example for that and in our institute uh, another scientist uh, uh, he is doing uh, the stay green introduction of stay green crutial this is related to the drought tolerance in sorghum stay tolerance uh, stay green is uh, one of the important trait for drought tolerance in sorghum and they have introduced this uh, stegrin uh, qtl sb stg 3a and stg 3b qtl in uh, the elite uh, sorghum lines and they are in uh, advanced stage so even after the physiological maturity your uh, plant uh, still uh, shows a uh, stage green so that is the importance of this trait so coming to the my work in the generation of second generation uh, biofuel the sorghum genotypes so with respect to ethanol production there are three different aspects one is first generation uh, which target which is juice based actually you have sweet sorghum so where you extract the juice and you convert it into ethanol the uh, second one is the second generation biofuel which where you use the dry stocks of sorghum so and the third one is the algal biomass so we will be concentrating on the second generation biofuel uh, system so our aim is uh, now you see government of india is also having a policy of blending ethanol bioethanol in the petrol so there is a huge demand there will be huge demand in future for bioethanol now we are to- totally dependent on sugarcane uh, for the production of ethanol uh, but uh, our target is uh, uh, sugarcane even though it is uh, very popular for bioethanol production there are some disadvantages with respect to sugarcane because it is a very long duration crop minimum 10 months to up to 12 months and uh, another Uh, aspect which we want to exploit is after sugarcane uh, cutting and uh, 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 sending to the mills the mills will be active only for 3 to 4 months then uh, total sugarcane will be exhausted that mills will be uh, having a lean patch where there won't be any thing so we want to focus on that particular period so that we will not affect the sh- sugarcane uh, thing also Uh, because uh, sweet sorghum we have uh, genotypes which has big bricks content equivalent to sugarcane we have 24 bricks also so we are targeting uh, the uh, expanding the area with respect to sweet sorghum so that uh, for example after march or april when the uh, sugar factories are uh, in the lean period so we can uh, uh, give this sweet sorghum uh, produce and uh, we can exploit that the only disadvantage uh, sweet sorghum is having uh, which we are working is the juice which is extracted from uh, uh, sweet sorghum uh, it can be stable only for up to say 4 to 5 days so beyond that it starts degrading whereas in sugar can you see trucks loads of thing will be lying in near the sugar mills so that has some stability so even after say uh, 20 days or one month they go for uh, this thing but the problem in sh- sweet sorghum is the stability is a problem so we we are uh, working on improving the stability of the juice so that it will become a popular uh, for the bioethanol production so that is the first generation i am working on the second generation where 
uh, we get the grain, but we use the stock for the bioethanol. So there is a double advantage. Uh, farmers get grain, the dry stock can be used for the bioethanol. The major problem in the case of uh, bioethanol from lignocellulosic based material is you have lignin. So lignin is tightly binding to the hemicellulose and cellulose. So when there is tight binding of lignin with hemicellulose and cellulose, the hydrolytic agents cannot act on the cellulose uh, to do the, um, uh, to bring the sugars into the solution. So that problem we are solving by uh, developing low lignin sorghum so that the cellulose is available for hydrolyzing agent. So sugars are uh, into the solution and it can be fermented into bioethanol. But there is one important aspect is uh, when you are targeting lignin, it is important for the uh, stability of the plant because when you reduce too much of lignin, the plant becomes weak and it will large and the problem is there. So we want to have a balance of uh, that. So the optimum level of lignin at which the plant stands. So that we wanted to do and uh, here what we are doing is we are targeting three genes. There is a trait called brown midrib. It is reported in sorghum as well as maize, pearl millet also. So the burn, uh, brown midrib is a surrogate trait for the low lignin. So whenever you have a brown midrib, the plant will have low lignin content in the stock. So we are target, we have used this uh, BMR2, BMR6 and BMR12. This uh, actually there are more than 20 genes, BMR genes reported in sorghum. Out of the four to five only are fully characterized. So out of that we have taken three genes. So out of these three genes, six and twelve already in US they have uh, uh, used and uh, developed uh, uh, intragression lines which are good in uh, agronomic performance. So that is proven. So we included another new gene P BMR2. So we try to do with uh, uh, one gene intragression, two gene intragression and three gene intragression to know like what is the optimum level of uh, lignin uh, for the plant to stand at uh, equivalent to the recurrent parent. So we used IBIMS dual purpose sorghum, uh, our released uh, variety CSV20 and 27 as a recurrent parent. Donor lines we got from US, one is uh, OKY11 uh, which is containing BMR2 and Atlas uh, BMR6 which is containing BMR6 gene and Atlas BMR12 which is containing the BMR12 gene. And there are markers reported, CAPS marker has been reported in these three genes. And we have developed one um, uh, the SSR based marker also for BMR12 gene. So we uh, used this uh, scheme like pyramiding of brown midrib genes. We used the recurrent parent and we crossed with the first BMR12 and we developed F1. We went for back cross and we uh, included, uh, added the BMR6 gene. So systematic and stepwise thing we did and we went for foreground selection using 60 SSR markers spread across the 10 uh, chromosomes of sorghum and foreground selection we use the gene specific markers. So using that we uh, went up to BCT, uh, BC2 uh, generation. Actually these are in the elite background because when you have a uh, very um, uh, non-elite background then you have to go for more backrests. So since uh, it is under a uh, B-line background, so we went for two backrests and in marker restricted backrossing you have the more precision of the getting the recovery of recurrent genome. So in that way we reduce the backrest to up to BC2 and we have now lines at BC2, F4, F5 generations. So what we identified is, so these are the hemicellulose, cellulose and lignin content in the uh, recurrent and uh, donor parent. You can see the cultivated, uh, the release varieties, it is around uh, 7, 6, 7 to 8 uh, percentage. Whereas in uh, low lignin uh, lines, this is single gene, you have 4 to 5 percentage range, you have the lignin. So this we used, uh, we got promising lines, you can see different uh, uh, gene combination. This is single gene uh, intragression. So we have under the background of CSV20 and uh, CSV27 also. So you have the lignin content uh, reduced from uh, 7 to around 4 it has been reduced. So you can see this is 2 gene combination. So still uh, it has come to 3. So we have, uh, we went for 3 gene also but 3 gene combination was very weak because too much of load of gene uh, the plant become weak so we did not go for 3 gene. So among the 2 gene combinations we got very promising lines. Uh, which uh, have uh, performance similar to the CSV20 and uh, 27 
and um, one more advantage we got is we had uh, lines four to five days early than the recurrent on par uh, yield as well as early to the this one so this uh, will be going for multi location testing so this will be uh, uh, we are not facing any lodging in this genotypes also even though lignin has come down so we are not facing any lodging and one another important thing is when lignin goes down it is prone to disease also disease and pest so that problem also we are not facing we have tested for uh, uh, two season at iimr so we now we will go for multi location and know like how it is performing so this is the major uh, work we, which we are involved so coming to the strategies uh, major strategy overall you can see for climate smart crops so you have uh, whatever we have discussed now you can see the, there is genetic resource there is genomic and phenomics uh, f- uh, thing and uh, uh, pre breeding and uh, genomic assisted breeding and you develop the climate resilient crops so under each category with respect to genetic resources you target core mini core or uh, when you go for um, genomic selection you go for training set reference set so you have while you go for uh, biparental or multi parent uh, population you go for nam magic rill uh, intra uh, regression lines like that and genomics you either go for qtl marker trait associations like that Uh, when you go for genomic selection you go for genomic uh, estimated breeding value and uh, phenotyping as i told uh, image based things and so many things are there nir and all those things and uh, pre breeding like uh, you can in, uh, use uh, wild species land traces or anything to exploit the genes available in that and you go for uh, genomic assisted breeding either through marker assisted selection marker assisted recurrence selection genomic selection like that and uh, novel lines donors alleles all this can be targeted through pre breeding thank you very much so any clarifications you want you can just yeah resistance we are not getting yeah some lines are uh, it is uh, tolerating low lignin some lines are totally it will become uh, this one some promising lines we have actually because we we are having the uh, range of genotypes where lignin content uh, reduction is from 30 to 50% so we can play around and identify the optimum thing like uh, you have without uh, affecting the uh, plant stand so that is that was our uh, aim and another thing is these uh, brown midrib uh, mutants they are good for uh, not only biofuel they are good for forage purpose also because the palatability has been uh, increased and recently we have uh, released one uh, bmr uh, variety i think csv 43 bmr i think so that uh, we have worked with uh, national institute of buffalo and it has been proved that after feeding this uh, 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 forage of this bmr 10% milk yield uh, increases there in the uh, buffalo so this we are focusing now more as as a biofuel crop as well as a forage because for in sorghum generally they are telling uh, there is a reduction in karif uh, sorghum yield karif uh, sorghum area but uh, nobody is uh, looking it is still dominant for forage forage sorghum in north india lot of area is there for uh, sorghum so that does not come into the calculation so that is like hidden kind of thing so and uh, in south india since uh, we have, we are predominantly rice growing people don't know the value of uh, sorghum as a fodder so that also we have to like uh, uh, ask the uh, may create awareness among the farmers what we are doing in the guntur uh, region so you can imagine that a sorghum farmer getting 6 uh, to 7 tons yield so with uh, huge dumping of urea so they generally what we do in sorghum we won't allow for tillering it is a single uh, plant there they just uh, put in the rice fellows dibble the in the residual moisture they give hardly two irrigations they don't put any other thing 
so uh, in a single uh, hill you get some four or five uh, tillers all are productive that much uh, fertility is there in the soil <laughs> so they are getting we are getting uh, three tons means they will get uh, say seven eight tons so that is becoming very popular and uh, we are uh, planning to promote in some other rice fellow regions also where uh, pre- because previously they were growing uh, this uh, black gram red uh, green gram because of mosaic virus uh, that uh, now has reduced and uh, people try to go for uh, maize but that needs lot of irrigation so we intervened there and we introduced sorghum now initially it was around uh, 20000 hectares now it has come up to 1 lakh hectares so that much uh, another thing is there should be market linkage even even if they produce too much there should be some person to take that so those farmers uh, they are linked up with some maharashtra some uh, based company so they take uh, the produce and uh, it is successfully going there actually and uh, there uh, one one more good thing is in sorghum we have karif rabi very unique uh, in rice fallows we are promoting karif hybrids as the suitable thing so that is coming up very good there also the farmers are uh, preferring only short uh, or medium hybrids because when it goes long larging happens uh, because of too much of growth so they they are asking for now short short height hybrids so we are uh, breeding for uh, short hybrids also which are suitable for rice fellows so that is the so whatever way we want to uh, increase the area we are doing <laughs> because this is the time Uh, millets is under focus and we have to yeah intermittent only once uh, in the residual moisture you are putting it will germinate after that you gave to irrigation hmm hmm Yeah. Mm. No, no, here they, they won't do any ploughing. Like you told the first situation, same thing happens. They simply dibble. They, there, won't, there is zero tillage. So after uh, harvesting your rice, uh, in the residual moisture, they will dibble. That will come up. So after... Uh, in the entire duration you give only two irrigation maximum so you get this much yield then you will find the 3.5 lakh hectares you can try if you want we can give the uh, we have the hybrids also so if you can convince the farmer and uh, put a demo or something because uh, you can uh, visit the uh, this tenali guntur region also how it is becoming popular another advantage of, because karif sorghum uh, the area is reducing because of the rain because full molding will be there all your grains will be black but here karif hybrid we are using in the rice fallow and the b- grain is very clean so you get a very good uh, quality grain also so hmm. which one yeah yeah that's why we are promoting them in rice fellow because karif uh, it will not stand against soybean or any maize or anything there is no possibility unless we go for biofuel or something where it adds more value karif uh, is very difficult that's why rabi area it is sustaining sorghum it is not uh, coming down drastically karif totally it has gone now that has been compensated through rice fellow Uh, only for food quality actually if you see uh, it is a pearly white grain and uh, it is somewhat uh, hard endosperm karif grain is soft endosperm that's why you are getting all this mold mold easily it grows into that now uh, varieties are different if you go grow rabi in karif it will not flower it is photosensitive so it is very unique but karif you can grow in rabi but you will not get the similar yield in rabi 
so that is very unique in sorghum that karif sorghum you grow in karif rabi sorghum you grow in rabi but now one added advantage of rabi sorghum karif sorghum is you can go grow in rice fallow where it is giving a, a better yield especially in uh, rice fallow only because that is a highly high fertility is there hybrid hybrid Kharif, it's still hybrid is predominant. Rabi, it is only variety. We don't have hybrids. Biofuel, we have hybrid also, variety also. In Kharif, uh, you have hybrid predominating. You have dual purpose types and you have forage. In Rabi, you have only, Rabi is uh, predominantly Dura race, which is highly photosensitive. it will uh, go, grow in very minimal uh, moisture and it will give, give a good yield so and uh, the grain is uh, good quality but uh, till uh, now we could not exactly point out what is ex- the quality required for rabi if you say m35-1 we, yeah m35-1 uh, farmers prefer because that is more than 50 year old variety but still it is rolling in rabi but we have varieties which are similar in biochemically we have analyzed like uh, what is the carbohydrate every protein everything so we have varieties which are equivalent to equivalent biochemically to m35-1 but still farmer prefers m35-1 yeah so maybe that uh, has the plasticity or some stability kind of thing and uh, something is there especially roti quality is good they are telling like after making a dough so the roti is very gluten is not there actually that is a separate procedure like uh, any everybody cannot prepare uh, sorghum roti because what they do they make a flour they add hot water they mix it and they using hand they will do so as uh, no homemaker can do uh, simply like that so it is it, it want it, it needs specific skills actually telangana karnataka ladies are very skilled in this uh, even in hyderabad which is a metropolitan city every street corner there is a jowar roti uh, one lady will be there and uh, she will be making jowar roti and our institute uh, has developed a roti maker in collaboration with one farmer so that farmer what he has we have given some uh, guidance to him that farmer what he has done is he has converted uh, our uh, uh, wet grinder is there he has removed that uh, uh, drum and he has made one uh, this uh, roller type thing so uh, the advantage is you have to mix the flour w- with uh, hot water and make a dough and you just put the ball in that and put the roller so it will make a perfect uh, roti and you can put in the tawa and then you can uh, just uh, roast it that much uh, development has come yeah no here the thing is uh, like uh, we are producing the grain only the waste part we are using for lignin it's not uh, we are growing sorghum for biofuel but still we need uh, st- uh, lignocellulosic st- feed stocks na no, for producing uh, hmm but wood also there is problem even when i proposed this project initially i proposed okay, uh, hmm yeah no no when uh, no that uh, i don't know how much uh, it is efficient in this uh, because the level of uh, uh, lignin Uh, with respect to wood, wood uh, wooden yeah. thing is yeah hmm
no but the thing is we we can avoid all those uh, technology what we are they are doing some treat special treatment and that directly you have already low lignin thing so you can give as a feed stock why you want to do for go for other uh, added things so that is the idea and uh, another thing is initially when i uh, proposed this project uh, involving grain also grain can also be used as a source for biofuel there they objected because that is a food path you cannot uh, compromise on food so then we uh, removed because that grain some genes are also identified so we removed the grain part and we only concentrated on the stock so that food is also there grain is also available to farmer stock can also be used for biofuel so in that way we are that's why we are using dual purpose sorghum for uh, as a recurrent parent so you can get a very good grain uh, yield as well as the uh, the stock yield no no stay green we are not using stay green uh, we are using only for uh, rabi situation because rabi situation rabi sorghum is growing and grown under residual soil moisture with uh, with very limited irrigation so there you need a stay green type to sustain the uh, that plant till uh, physiology moisture not this is only karif based actually biofuel things are in karif based not rabi any industrial based uh, use in sorghum is oriented towards uh, karif only all food things are oriented towards rabi because there is drastic this difference in grain quality from karif and rabi very unique volatile when you pass across i don't know about that because volatiles we are working for fruit fly also so what we have identified is the susceptible genotypes when we uh, when the sorghum fruit fly feeds it produces volatiles so it is like acting as a some attractant kind of thing but another thing what we have identified uh, regarding volatile is there is a, uh, one sorghum called centered sorghum we have collected from bundelkhand region uh, that is having a scent in the uh, like basmati you have no basmati rice exactly same uh, scent it is there in leaf when you just uh, uh, smell the leaf it comes and in grain also it comes and we tried uh, making a biscuit out of that uh, scented sorghum it gives very good flavor but till today there is no much uh, popularization commercialization on that like basmati if we bring up that it may come but what we we have done is we have identified uh, that gene which is simi- that gene is similar to in which they identified in basmati so same uh, volatile uh, gene has been reported here so that uh, if you go when we grow that central sorghum na if you go that smell uh, that basmati smell will come so that uh, some of the lines we have collected actually interesting yeah <laughs> yeah red sorghum actually uh, the our main focus as i told karif area is that is drastically decreasing so what our idea is red sorghum is having some uh, phenolics and anthocyanin so it gives uh, tolerance for grain mold uh, development so we want to promote uh, red grain for karif because red grain has very much uh, industrial use and it has very good export potential if you see china and all they are asking for red sorghum So recently only we started red sorghum breeding actually and uh, i think uh, molecular we are not doing no 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 so we just only initiated arna madam i think 4 5 years back she initiated and i think right now she has some good lines so other than that uh, we are not focusing much yeah it is equivalent it, it uh, equivalent yeah some of the lines are good it's uh, it is grain only yeah, yeah but it is tolerant to grain mold that they have uh, found when compared to white uh, that is giving good tolerance
not red there is one yellow sorghum actually red grain till now nobody uses for uh, food purpose i don't come across anybody but there is a special sorghum called yellow sorghum uh, that uh, especially in tandoor palam that region they uh, develop uh, even the research institutes they develop and many of the farmers they feel that uh, if they take that uh, they will not get uh, this joint pain and so many things they are telling i don't know how much it is true but uh, that also nobody has uh, gone into that what exactly whether beta carotene is there or what is there we don't know but that is very popular uh, especially red sorghum uh, the the yellow sorghum roti itself costly than white sorghum roti so that is there some medicinal use may be there we have to yeah yeah hmm we are uh, now uh, one uh, dr malti is uh, she has joined biochemistry she is doing all colors of sorghum all the biochemical starting from uh, uh, black uh, brown red yellow white everything so we should know exactly what is there uh, somebody tell in black thing some anthocyanin is there it is good but uh, i don't know when you make roti whether people will like or not we don't know <laughs> many problems are there no no you, actually if you if you want i can show some of the products people may, may uh, people may be surprised to know this type of uh, things are there all discuss mother with the nalla indications are there so they are like that they can capture yeah yeah many see many startups uh, actually last five we have got a uh, how to to come to screen skip the See, I will show the kind of products which you have developed. And uh, if you want uh, to try different uh, recipes, you go to our website. Uh, there are recipes at home you can try. Uh, many people don't know this, but uh, while coming to nutritional composition you can see so all the millets so for many of the things you can see uh, actually carbohydrate also it is uh, somewhat less uh, whereas in protein fat some of the millets are rich in um, different aspects coming to the this uh, micronutrients also you can see uh, with respect to calcium ragi is more with respect to iron content you have uh, bajra will be high bajra banyard millet so like this it is a, like a, uh, nowadays what we are uh, uh, promoting is multi millet kind of uh, mix uh, so many things so everything will be coming into your uh, this one and uh, coming to the some products see these are some of the machineries which we have developed so primary processing machineries which our institute uh, uh, when we started nothing was there now whatever you can make using wheat maize and uh, rice you can use use using all the millets so any product you say we have that product so these are the you can see this uh, puffs na it is very popular among the 
children actually you have popcorn in the movie halls maize popcorn so it is similar to popcorn but in popcorn uh, the complete thing is blast and it becomes irregular here it just expands to the maximum that sorghum grain or any millet grain we expand that to the maximum and it can be directly used as a snack so many kids uh, like this and uh, we have a sales counter we sell all this kind of uh, things you have a uh, idli mix you have this uh, kurkure type you have the semia noodles you have cookies you have bread you have pizza base so like this so all kinds of this diversification we are doing like uh, pearling debranding milling uh, to making a flour you have a uh, uh, roasting ready to eat you have this uh, malt so all kinds of uh, bakery products you have so many so like this uh, it is there. see these are our uh, brand eat right is our uh, iamr brand so we produce uh, right now we are commercializing uh, more than 30 different products under this brand and un- more around 100 are in pipeline actually we uh, we have developed recipes for uh, ragi cake uh, and uh, so many things this is the roti maker i told this is simply this is a grind- wet grinder so that farmer has modified uh, into a roti maker so this uh, the left hand side one is the first one it was a very big this is a portable one second one is the portable so any household you can just have that and you can do and you can see all this uh, pasta macaroni miscelli so you can see this uh, poha so everything is there and we have the recipes also you can see these are the recipes so which are in the website so recently we have developed international recipe also so you can have that recipes also so this is the incubation facility what madam was telling so we have a dsc sponsored dsc has given 10 crore uh, grant so uh, for the last 5 years we have uh, we are uh, training the startups we are uh, hand holding them we are providing funding to develop the product we are uh, helping in branding so all these things and uh, after one year he will uh, go out and he will start his own like that uh, till now more than uh, 300 uh, startups we have uh, helped so you can see these are the facilities what we are having so many iit and uh, even uh, computer science people now they are into the startup business so they make huge profits uh, people uh, uh, they started a millet restaurant even in hyderabad airport now recently they have started millet restaurant exclusively for millets millet marvels like that so like that uh, actually that person is uh, i think uh, many of you might have seen this unnai polur one movie kamal hasan unnai polur one in that one uh, police officer will come there are two police officers uh, one person is that millet marvel uh, owner so he promotes millets <laughs> okay ma'am yeah i'm giving a presentation and i'm very patient in your interventions yeah thank you so much thank you ma'am Already, we have hybrid suitable for that. So, if you want to try.